Okay, waves and the development of the new atomic model. We're talking about the quantum mechanical model here. That's what we're looking at in uh, developing here, and that has a lot to do with the electron cloud. And we did watch a short little video last time, um, a TED Ed, and I'm gonna put the link on Blackboard for you. You can go back and rewatch it if you'd like to. If you missed it, weren't here. So, going back over waves real quick, since uh, it's been a long break. For the 1900s, science has thought that light behaves solely like a wave, but later on it was clear that light also has more characteristics of like particles, okay? So the idea that light can behave as a particle and as a wave, and those particles were labeled as photons, we're going to get into that a little bit, and then later on how this particular process and idea came into being for the electron. So let's review some wave information here. Electromagnetic radi radiation is a form of energy here that exhibits wave-like behavior as it travels through the space or the vacuum. And the different types of electromagnetic radiation are on the spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum. We label that EMR for short, okay? All forms of electromagnetic radiation, whether it's radio waves through gamma rays, they all travel at the speed of light, and we're going to address the speed of light later on down the notes, which is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So here is a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. And like I said, we have our radio waves over here. They have longer wavelengths, and that little symbol lambda is the, the symbol for wavelength. Low frequency and frequency is labeled as a variable V. Now, the ones that have long wavelengths, low frequencies, also have low energy. These are relationships we're going to establish, and you'll have a couple of equations that go with them uh, as to generating which type of electromagnetic radiation it's going to have. Over here, the gamma, we know about gamma from our Unit 2 stuff where we were talking about um, gamma rays having high penetration and they cause cancer and things, but they have really short wavelengths, they have high frequency, and they have high energy. So, um, as like I said, there's an inverse relationship there and then there's a direct relationship there between, between those three variables, frequency, wavelength, and energy. And as you can see, visible light's in the middle there and whether or not you like to claim indigo as a color or not. All of those are going to be in accordance with specific wavelengths. That's what we're really caring about. Like over here at, at uh, red, 700 nanometers, all the way over here to the violet side, which is the shorter wavelengths are gonna be 400 nanometers. And those are gonna be important values later on when we do some of our calculations. You'll see that also in the lab activity today. We'll be looking at those specific wavelengths that correspond to particular colors. We can only track the visible light part of the spectrum because everything else we can't see with our eyes. We cannot see infrared, we cannot see ultraviolet, okay? But we're going to be, you know, tracking our different substances with the visible light spectrum. This one is also showing you, it's a reverse graphic too, because over here on this side is the gamma. This is the high energy side, so the gamma rays are over here. Okay, but it's also, in this particular one, it relates it to the nanometers. So very small wavelengths over here, you see the nanometers. And over here, you see longer wavelengths, meters. That's up there with the radio waves, radio waves being long. But it also, this graphic is helpful because it also shows you frequencies. So you have very high uh, frequencies for the gamma rays. And then over here you have low frequencies for your radio waves and the longer wavelengths and then the lower energy is also shown here. It's just a different graphic but it also puts the wavelength with their measurements and their frequencies in terms of wavelengths there, the hertz and the different, so you see nanometers for the shorter ones, you see centimeters in there and then you'll see meters. Those are all different ways to measure the wavelength depending on the size because K 
can't use nanometers for radio waves, that's not a very good measurement there. But you wouldn't want to use meters for gamma rays either because they're really, really, really small. All right, so we went over this last time, but the crest is the top of the wave, the trough is the bottom of the wave, the middle is the origin. I told you to redraw your line there, make sure that it's in the middle. The dotted line should be in the middle there. Let the wavelengths go from crest to crest or trough to trough. That's the easiest way to measure them. Okay, one particular one. You could do probably, you know, one oscillation too if you want to think about it that way. Wavelength is, like I said before, is noted by this symbol, which is a lowercase lambda, and that's a Greek symbol, but through physics, through any other science classes, they always label it with that particular symbol as the variable. Now, in this particular diagram here showing you, this is the same wavelength, but it just is not, the, the height of the wave is, is shorter. But something like this has a higher frequency because there's more oscillations, more waves in the same particular time period. So this one would have higher frequency than the top wave because there's more oscillations that you get to the same time frame right here. You have more waves occurring in the bottom picture. So smaller wavelength, higher frequency there. Here, once again, looking at, we're looking at amplitude now, amplitude being the height of the wave. So uh, going from the origin to the top or the origin to the bottom is where you're going to be in order to label that. Greater amplitude, we're talking about the intensity of the wave and light intensity, uh, it's hard to imagine uh, necessarily, but the height of the waves too in sound make it louder. So if you have a, a larger amplitude, you're going to have a louder sound than a uh, softer sound. But in intensity, it's the same idea for light. All right, for the wavelengths, please write them down. You're going to see them measured in nanometers, centimeters, or meters, and I know there's a blank missing, so just add in an extra blank there. We're going to be focused on more of this area, the nanometer range, because visible light is expressed in nanometers. And we'll be looking at and calculating with that particular prefix. That's why we wanted you to know that from unit one, the nanometer one there. All right, we went over, did we get to frequency last time? sure if we did, but frequency is the number of waves that pass through a point in a certain period. So frequency is measured in something called hertz. This is the unit. And really hertz just means one wave per second or waves per second. Okay. So you can technically write hertz also if you want to. You could write it as one over second. That could be the unit, although most people don't like to write one over a unit. It's just not a comfortable way to write it. Or if you're really savvy, you can write it as S to the minus 1. And you'll see units expressed like that as well, because that means per second. The second is on the bottom. Okay, just like regular exponential rules, something to the negative 1 is on the bottom of the fraction. Okay. So looking here, once again, we have... The uh, same frequency here, we don't have the same amplitude, but because um, there's the same amount of waves in the same given amount of time shown up here in this diagram. But this one has a higher frequency, the bottom one now, because there's more wave oscillations in that particular given amount of time. So greater frequency, more waves per second. But as you can see, that also made the wavelength get more narrow. So the wavelength shrunk. Because now it's right here, wavelength, compared to it being much longer up here. So as you can see, we're seeing an indirect or inverse relationship between the frequency and the wavelength. So as you increase the frequency, your wavelength gets shorter. So we're going to look at that particular relationship. Right now, as a matter of fact, so looking at these trends as frequency of a wave increases, the wavelength is going to decrease. So we say that's an inversely proportional relationship or indirect in math. 
So as the wavelength goes up, the frequency goes down and vice versa. So if the frequency goes up, the wavelength's going to decrease. Now, as stated before, too, that frequency is related to the energy. The frequency and the energy are direct. If the frequency goes up, the energy goes up. So you could also say that energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. The longer the wavelength, the lower the energy that there's going to be there as well. So there's a couple relationships here to look at. Now, the re relationship between wavelength and frequency can be written in this equation, and you will have to be able to calculate with this equation. We call this the speed of light equation, but basically what we have here, move this out of the way, wavelength times the frequency is going to always equal the speed of light, which is 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So you, if you know the wavelength, you can always calculate the frequency. If you know the frequency, you can always find the wavelength, no matter what. And yes, this will you know, appear on your test. This will also be in the formal lab report. So we'll be using these equations and calculating wavelengths, and then therefore energy later on that you'll be able to see. Okay? So make sure you fill that in real quick. And then we are going to do a practice problem. Okay, so let's look at a practice problem now. All right, find the frequency of a photon with a wavelength of 434 nanometers. Now, first thing we need to do is figure out our variables. I'll put this over here in the corner. Maybe it will stay out of the way. Given, what are we given? We don't know frequency. That's what we're trying to find. We are given wavelength at 434 nanometers, but if you noticed on the previous page, the speed of light is measured in meters per second. So in order to use that equation, our wavelength will have to be also in meters. So before we can begin, we need to change that over. Now, how do we change that over? Dimensional analysis, and what is the conversion factor for nanometers to meters? So we put nanometers down here. We're going to meters up here. Now you can do the 10 to the 9 nanometers equals 1 meter, mm -hmm. or you could do 10 to the minus 9 meters equals 1 nanometer. It really doesn't matter. I like to stick with whole numbers. So, you know, 1 times 10 to the 9 here to 1 meter. And what do we end up getting for our answer over here? Once you stick it in the calculator. So you're basically dividing it by 1 times 10 to the 9. Or if you did it the other way, where you did the 1 times 10 to the negative 9 on the top and 1 on the bottom, it's the same thing. So it may get an answer. What do we get here? 4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, correct. So now that we have that variable in place, we'll be able to go. What else do we need to know in order to solve? We need to know our speed of light, and that's given to us. That's always the same number. What is that? 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Now that we know these values, right, we can start Getting ready to solve, we know everything that we need to do to plug in the equation. So if I my equation is C equals lambda times V, what is V going to equal in terms of variables? How do I get V by itself? I would divide both sides by lambda, right? So it's going to be C over lambda, right? 
You can rearrange the variables before or after. I really don't care. And then here, all we have to do is plug in our numbers. So we put in our speed of light over our lambda. And if you notice nicely, the meters will cancel. So we're left with per second. And per second happens to be what? 1 over second equals hertz. Okay, don't forget that. But the m's are going to, you know, cancel out, and you're going to still have the 1 over the second there, and yeah, it's going to be your hertz value. So let's calculate this. What do we get for v? Oops, let me go back. And what does v equal? And here, what would we base our significant figures off of in the calculation? The only measured value they gave us was what? 434. So I want to try to make this clear too. So the speed of light is a constant value. It is a constant measurement. You would not need to use that for significant figures. You would use the measured value in the problem. Okay. So anything that is given to you that is a constant value, you do not base your significant figures off of. So yes, after doing this, what do we calculate and get? Anyone? Six point Six point what? Six point nine one what? Times ten to the fourteenth. Don't forget there's a exponent on that one, a big one at that. And yes, it would be hertz, or you could write it as, you know, per second. So here would be your final answer. For that particular calculation. So just to make sure we, you know, run through the setup again, given, you change that over, get your speed of light written down, then you can manipulate the equation to get your variables in the right place, and then do set the setup and get your answer. Okay, question? What does so we have to show it like that? Or can we just do the work? You would just need to do the work, but like at the beginning there, if they gave you something in nanometers, you would have to show the conversion to meters first. Yes, there would that, that additional step would need to be shown, okay, that you realize that you need to have it in meters before you can plug it into the equation. All right, so the electromagnetic spectrum, I believe you need to go ahead and label uh, going along there, showing you the different A being the radio waves, B being the microwaves, C is infrared. Everybody's familiar with infrared. You know, they show you those in the movies where the, all the military guys, guys are wearing the infrared goggles and they see the heat signatures. Yes. D is, of course, visible light. E up here is ultraviolet, just slightly above violet if you want to think about it that way and infrared being slightly below red, and the other side of red, before red. And then of course F is x-rays and G is going to be gamma rays. And on here, once again, it goes over these relationships that are very important. Short wavelengths, high frequency, high energy. Okay, so frequency and energy are related to wavelength. Frequency and energy are direct and the wavelength is going to be opposite or inverse in terms of its uh, relationship. Over here, longer wavelengths, lower frequency, lower energy. Once again, the energies match. They are you know, of this, their direct relationship, and then the wavelength is going to be opposite and inverse. 
Okay. Are we all good with that? Everybody's got those written down. Moving on. All right, quantum theory. Let's go and talk about Planck. He observed the emission of light from hot objects and concluded energy is emitted in small, uh, specific amounts. And one specific amount of energy that is given <coughs> off or emitted is a quantum. Quantum is singular for quanta, which happens to be plural. And we're going to be talking about quantized energy throughout the rest of this unit and the way the electrons behave because they also are going to absorb and emit certain amounts of energy. So in order to get an idea here of what we're talking about, for the light or the electrons, it doesn't really matter what we're talking about, they gain and lose energy in minimum amounts of these quantized energy amounts. So the minimum amount of energy change lost or gained by the electrons or the photons, it really doesn't matter what we're talking about, that's going to be one quantum. Now these are very, very small amounts of energy, and they're not a lot of energy you're going to see. We're going to be providing plenty of energy to our atoms. Through the flame test, we'll be using the flame, and through today you'll be seeing that the energy source is electricity that will be providing it plenty of energy to absorb and release. All right, so the classical theory idea is like it's like a slope. There is, you know, just gradual, goes up. Planck's idea of quantized energy it would be more like a staircase. You cannot go halfway up a stair. You can either, it's an all or nothing. So in order to get to the next level, you have to absorb that amount of energy in order to get there. You can't go halfway. You can't go halfway up a step. So if you don't absorb the entire amount of energy to get to that next level, you stay where you are. You don't move. So whereas if it was a slope idea, you could gradually move up. Here, you have to, it's an all or nothing phenomenon. You have to get to this next step up here or you just stay, you're staying right here at this step. And depending on how much energy absorbs in order to get to say a step up here, you know, then you have one, two, you know, three quantized amounts that you would have to absorb to get up to that step. And it's gonna make a little bit more sense here when we start talking about the electron uh, model and the energy levels of where the electrons reside, because that's really what we're talking about, them moving around the electron um, energy levels as to being able to do that based on how much energy they're absorbing. But quantized energy is like a step. It's all or nothing. You can't move to that next level unless you get that minimum amount of energy. All right, Einstein observed, he's part of this too because he took Planck's ideas and kind of ran with it. Um, Planck's ideas more, uh, revolved more around light and photons but Einstein observed the photoelectric effect, the emission of electrons from metal when light shines on the metal. Now, light being shined on the metal has to be in a certain uh, amount of wavelength. So if you were to shine red light on the metal, no electrons would actually eject from the metal because red has a longer wavelength and it has lower energy. But something right here that has 450, nanometers is more in the blue range. It has a shorter wavelength, so it has more energy. So the blue uh, light was able to eject the electrons from the metal, whereas like red light was not. Of course, white light would be able to do it because white light has all of the different wavelengths in it, has the whole spectrum of the visible light. So as we're shining it on a piece of metal, whether or not the electrons were being ejected from it, but it is based off of, you know, like, if it didn't meet that threshold, didn't get to that step, the electrons were staying put. With red, they were staying put because it didn't give them enough energy to meet that minimum amount. With the blue here, it was able to meet that minimum amount, so the electrons were 
able to leave and move uh, from the metal, okay? So keep that in mind, that's what we're talking about there. Basically what we're going through here is you had Planck, then you had Einstein. Einstein's idea eventually you know, gets translated into the electron idea, being able to say that electrons have that wave particle duality. It's all building up to this new quantum model. There were lots of people involved and lots of different experiments added to it, as you also saw in the video. So for an electron to be knocked loose from an atom, it must be struck with a photon that has a minimum energy. And the minimum energy, of course, means a minimum frequency because energy and frequency are directly related. So if we're looking at this helium atom and we have a low energy photon, nothing will happen because it doesn't meet that quantized minimum threshold. Over here, a high energy photon, though, can hit it, knock out the electron because it has met that threshold of the quantized energy amount. So Einstein concluded that light has properties of both waves particles, that wave particle duality, and a photon is a particle of light that carries a quantized amount of energy. So this is what Einstein, you know, gave us later on. Boy, uh, he's going to be the one to change it over into using this idea as part of the electron or how, how the electron behaves. <coughs> Energy of a photon is directly proportional to its frequency. Directly proportional. Now, this is another equation that you will have to know where energy equals Planck's, Planck's constant times the frequency. Now, you don't have to memorize Planck's constant. We will give that to you. You will need to just be able to use it. It is a weird number, 6.6262 times 10 to the minus 34, and that is joules times seconds over here. This is the way the unit is written. And yes, they, they label these constants by the units so they cancel properly. But if we know the wavelength or the frequency, we can always calculate the energy of the particular photon or electron that we're talking about using this equation. If you're given the wavelength first, then you use the speed of light equation to find the frequency. Then you can put the frequency in here and figure out the energy. Or if you're just given the frequency to start with, then you can just use this equation first and not have to bother with the speed of light one to begin with. So energy is measured in joules. Joules, you know this from um, our lessons in unit one. Clock's constant, just write it down. Joules times seconds, 6.6262 times 10 to the minus 34. And then, of course, frequency is measured in hertz, which, once again, remember, is 1 over second. So that's why these lovely um, units are going to be able to cancel and you end up with joules when you're calculating for energy. So let's go ahead and find the energy of a red photon with the frequency and take a look at that particular problem. Same idea, we're going to set it up, figure out the missing variable, and go ahead and calculate. So given, we're not given energy, we need to find energy. We are given the frequency. The frequency is listed up here. And, of course, we also know Planck's constant. Is 
it just six, six, <coughs> two, six, two? Yes. So there's no more sixes. I'm starting to lose my mind now, yes, okay. Jules times second, okay. And then now we can take our equation and manipulate it. Because, well, we don't need to because we have our equation. Oops. I don't know why there's two P's here, but it would be Planck's constants times V. So we'll cross that one out. And then all we have to do now is plug in and solve. Okay? So we get. second so as you can see I wrote it that way so that I can demonstrate to you that the seconds are going to cancel and then you are left with the joule here as your unit so let's calculate that what do we get and base your significant figures once again once again based off of the measured value above the Hertz here this is where we need to base it off of this is our measured value. So we end up with the energy equaling what? 3.03 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Is that what you got? Yes? No? Yes? No? As you can see, it's a very small amount. not a very large amount of energy. So once again, running through it all, we have our frequency and our Planck's constant. We're going to put, plug it in and we end up with our answer. So you can go back and go over these. I am going to give you a few more practice problems to do later on, either in a wiser or in a warm-up just to get from more familiar with these equations and the new lovely units and other things they're telling you. So let's get on to Bohr's model. Bohr's model is the one with the orbits. It has the rings that go around the uh, <coughs> nucleus. It's a little bit different than Rutherford's model, which was a nuclear model well as well, where you had a dense center, but he didn't necessarily have these fixed orbits. He just had them orbiting. Um, but based on Bohr's calculations and things, he, he had arranged his atom to where they were in these fixed particular rings that went around the nucleus. Now let's talk about his experimentation and how he came up with his data. Hydrogen's line emission spectrum. So he did a lot of experimenting with this. When electric current is passed through the uh, tube filled with the hydrogen gas, the gas gives a pinkish glow. This is true, okay? You're going to see this too in, in a minute over there. I'm going to show you. Uh, you're going to be looking at these as well today. Then light is passed through the, through the prism, separates into di distinct bands of light corresponding to specific energies, frequencies, and wavelengths. So, when we put the energy in by the electricity here to the gas tube, the electrons go from the ground state here to the excited state. So, they've absorbed energy. And that means they have also changed energy levels. They have moved further away from the nucleus. And by doing so, they just as quickly as they absorb the energy. They don't, they're not very massive or anything, so they end up releasing the energy very quickly and move back down to their ground state configuration closer to the nucleus. They give off a photon in the process that equals the energy that they absorbed. And the amounts that they absorbed are quantized, and that's what you're going to see for every element. They're going to have their own specific banding pattern because they only absorb in certain quantized amounts, not the continuous spectrum here. Hydrogen has four lines in its 
line emission spectrum, four different colors, and i um, going to go ahead and show you real quick what you're going to be looking at today after we finish the notes. Okay, so now, after looking at how this is done and what we're going to be doing in the lab, we see the photon, we're going to see the banding patterns, those are the specific energies um, equivalent to those frequencies and wavelengths that we're going to be able to see in the banding pattern. So the line emission spectrum is basically the atom's fingerprint, okay? So like as you saw, hydrogen, hydrogen had four bands. Helium has a few more, but helium also has an additional electron. Only two electrons and it has a lot more lines to it. The continuous spectrum right here splits the white light into a rainbow. It's like the slope idea, the classical idea. It's very gradual, okay? As opposed to the emission, line emission spectrums where you have actual breaks in the, in the light bands. Like there's no, there's no light in here. In this section right here, nothing's being given off. No energies or wavelengths in that particular part of it. So like I said, you're gonna, on your lab, you're gonna draw it like that. You're gonna use colored pencils and draw and space out the bands as you see them. And you're also, I was hoping for sunlight today, although it's rainy, but um, you can try to look out there or you might just have to look up at the white light uh, provided in the classroom to do the continuous one. Take a look at it. All right, so what is a ground state, the lowest energy state of an atom? So the electrons are arranged closest to the nucleus because the attractive force of the nucleus, remember they have positive charge there, it attracts to the negative charges of the electrons. And that attractive force, when it's in its lowest, um, when it's closest to the nucleus, then it would be considered in its lowest energy state. An excited state is when the um, atom has a higher energy potential. So it is absorbed energy and we're going to give it energy through the electricity. We're going to give those gases in the tubes energy that way. And we're going to excite the atoms. And then we're gonna see different wavelengths being given off due to the electron movement. These electronic transitions is what they're called. The electrons are gonna start moving and absorbing energy and releasing energy in accordance with certain wavelengths. So electrons exist only in orbits with specific <coughs> amounts of energies called energy levels. That was his basic definition. Therefore, uh, can only gain or lo lose certain amounts of energy. This still kind of fits with Planck's idea, with Einstein's idea. The idea of energy levels actually still corresponds with quantum mechanical model. It's just that his energy level design is different than it actually is. There's three-dimensional spaces located in these energy levels. His was a bit very basic, but he did all of his experimentation on hydrogen, which is the most basic element, and it only has one electron. So you can imagine why that's what happened there. Only certain photons are produced. Okay, that's what we're gonna see here, only certain photons being produced. Now, before we go on to the next part where we're actually going through the steps, just want to show you that on a Bohr model, which is showed up here with the rings, when we want to show that an atom has, um, or an electron has absorbed energy, the electrons will jump out further from the nucleus. So like if you had one in this energy level, to draw that it is absorbing energy, you would draw and point the arrow away from the nucleus. The distance, the number of energy levels, you remember each one's like a quantized amount in order to get out there, in order to get further away from the nucleus. Now when we wanna show that electrons are emitting energy, say right here, we would draw it going back in towards the nucleus to its ground state, wherever it was, depending on which energy level it was residing in. So uh, once again, this is where we're gonna see the the photon gets, is given off. This is where we see the, the color, a band of, band of the uh, light here. When it falls back, it gives off that amount of energy. 
things that jump further out have to absorb more energy, so they're going to be more in the blues and purples. Electrons that don't absorb as much energy, that don't have to travel as far out, are going to be more in the red and orange range, okay? Because those wavelengths are longer and lower energy. So let's go ahead and go through the steps here. So an electron gets hit by a photon or some kind of energy source, whether it's flame or electricity or whatnot, it's going to absorb energy. The electron jumps to a higher energy level and we call that the excited state. <coughs> The electron loses energy and it drops back down to its lower energy level, the ground state, where it normally resides. And then a photon of light is emitted that equals the difference between the levels. So they said that the longer the distance means more energy has to be absorbed, more quantized amounts. So you're going to have shorter wavelengths, higher frequency, higher energy things. And we're going to be looking at the visible spectrum, so for the ones that are higher on the visible spectrum are going to be your violets and blues, your purples and blues. The ones that don't have as much energy and aren't as far away jumping from the nucleus give off wavelengths of less energy, which would be reds and, and oranges. Of course, yellows and greens are in the middle. They follow the rainbow idea here. All right. So, once again, looking here, if we want to draw it on our diagrams, you know, for the first diagram, electron absorbing energy, basically all you need to do is take that dot and do what with it? Draw the arrow what? Going out. So draw the arrow going out on your first diagram there because it's absorbing energy. On the other diagram, we want to show that it's emitting energy. So what would you do for that one? I think it's like over here somewhere, right? We would draw it falling back, the arrow pointing in, and therefore be able to do that. Yeah, the, the other one was over here, so you would draw it out. And the one emitting, you draw towards the nucleus with the arrow. That's how you would show emission versus absorption. Emission versus absorption. So when an electron absorbs a specific amount of energy, uh, we'll go to a higher energy orbit. When an electron falls back, it drops back to a lower energy orbit, releasing the energy, and we see the photon or the band. This is a, a really good diagram showing you the absorption over here. Okay, so here is the energy being absorbed, so they're both jumping out. Of course, this one is not as far of a distance as that one. So as you can see, the amount and the wavelength here, that wavelength is longer than this one over here where the wavelength is shorter. So more energy is being absorbed by the one that has to jump further out. Over here, emission, showing emission. Once again, they're falling back. It's giving off the wave. Once again, the longer wavelength, which would be more like a red. And this one, falling back further, has a shorter wavelength, and the light that we're going to see would be more like a blue, okay? Now here, I want you to write these in on your, uh, <coughs> on your uh, ABC diagram there. So we have our energy levels, and you can represent them. The energy levels go 1 to 6, so N equals 1 would be down at the very bottom, closest to the A, B, C, D. N equals 2, N equals 3, and so forth. So the energy of the photon depends on the difference. Bohr's calculated energies matched the um, infrared, the visible, and the UV lines for the hydrogen atom, but it really was just the hydrogen atom only. So don't forget to write this down. This goes in that blank. The difference in the energy levels is important. So our first transition goes from energy level two to or three to two. That one's a short uh, distance. So as you can see, it gives off the red color. Okay. So for A, what would you write there under A? That one should be. What color? Red, good. Now for B, it 
going from energy level four to energy level two. That one's giving off which color? Green, good. And the one going from energy level five down to energy level two, when it's emitting its light, it's giving off that blue color. So that one would be for C. And then last but not least, the going from the sixth energy level into the second energy level there, it is going to be <coughs> emitting the uh, most amount of energy, which corresponds to the violet or the purple one there for D. Okay, so write that in there, your energy level. These transitions of visible light all are taken to account from uh, the uh, electronic transitions involving these particular energy levels. We can't see the energy that is given off when it's going to the first energy level. If you're looking at this particular series, the Lyman series is of UV light, so we can't see UV light, but there are electronic transitions that take place that are of more energy, higher energy. To go all the way back from N equals two to N equals one, N equals one is a very large distance. So this is in the UV range. We can't see the UV range, so we wouldn't be able to detect that. Well, the only one we can see is the Balmer series because our eyes can detect visible light. The Passion series too, there are some electronic transitions that take place in the infrared range. We can't see that unless we you know, put on those heat seeking goggles that they show in the movies, be able to detect those. All right, unfortunately, Bohr's model did not work for anything but hydrogen, so the specific orbit idea is not held true. But he did give us the idea of energy levels, and yes, we used that. There is a particular N equals the principal energy level within, and though there are lots of other things we'll talk about. Did not account for multi-electron atoms or the chemical natures of adding atoms or bonding because his calculations couldn't work for any other atom or didn't work for any other atom. But we do have the, the atomic fingerprint, the line emission spectrums, also from his experimentation, and the basic idea of the energy levels have been established by Bohr.